Buenos dias. Bonjour. Bonjour. Good morning. And to all of my friends from the English speaking and quasi English speaking world, welcome. Thank you very much and good morning. Thank you for being here. Uh, it is a pleasure to see so many familiar faces. Uh, at our last CANSEC conference uh, occurred literally my second week on the job, and I was very much uh, learning and listening. I am still learning and I am still listening, and that will continue through this week, but it's, uh, it's a delight to see so many fam familiar partners that we have worked with closely over this past year. I'd like to give a very warm welcome to all of our defense and security chiefs and to our partners from regional organizations our partners across the U.S. government, our partners from Canada, Colombia, and Europe. To each of you I say thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your friendship and for your commitment to advancing our shared security together. I look forward to our conversations over the next two days. We're going to engage in thought-provoking discussion and have the opportunity to see a great example of information sharing in action during our visit to the U.S. Coast Guard sector, San Juan. Now, I'll try to keep my remarks brief so that we can get started with our discussions. Now, first and most importantly, this word of thanks. Events like this are impossible to pull together without a great team. A great team that we are fortunate to have in the Puerto Rican National Guard and the U.S. Coast Guard and in our U.S. Southcom staff. So on behalf of all of us who benefited last night from the hard work that went into uh, setting up our social event, but then in the work that will take place over the course of the next two days, a warm round of applause to all of the folks who've been responsible for this event. Thanks for the hard work behind the scenes to make this conference such a success. As many of you have noticed, the theme of this year's conference is a little bit different. I'd like to draw your attention to the four words, a network of trust. Why are these two ideas so important? Well, I think everybody in this room would agree that today's global security environment is more complex and unpredictable than any point in our careers. We live in a transformed world where threat networks have diversified, gone global, and reached macroeconomic proportions. We live in a transformed world in which humanitarian crises are not isolated events that we watch on the news. In the blink of an eye, they are on our shores and at our doorsteps. I'd like to dwell for a few moments on how that first challenge, threat networks, has changed. Now, if this were 1986 or 1996 or even 2006, we'd likely be talking about how drug trafficking is the most pressing problem facing many of our countries. But somewhere along the way, something changed. And in 2016, drugs alone are not the main thing that we have to worry about. Neither are the myriad illicit commodities that move through our hemisphere as part of a global flow of illegal goods and services. These illicit flows and the violence and corruption these flows introduce at our countries are just the visible manifestation of amorphous and adaptable networked threats. These networked threats are themselves a product of the transformed world that we live in. The same conditions that have led to deeper integration and unprecedented openness in trade travel and communications between our nations have facilitated the proliferation of criminal and extremist networks across the globe. And as network threats, they cannot be treated as something separate or apart from the other challenges that we face, like poverty, youth unemployment, and corruption. As network threats, they are interconnected in ways that increase the risk of unexpected crises and unfavorable outcomes for all of our nations. Threat networks 
and the growing illegal economies that support them undercut the interests of many of us across multiple countries and multiple continents. They operate unrestricted by laws, unimpeded by morality, and empowered by enormous profits. They take advantage of the latest technological developments and they exploit our mutual vulnerabilities. Many networks are globally integrated enterprises operating wherever a profit can be made or a population can be exploited. Some have cornered the market in cocaine trafficking and some dabble in polycrime activities. Others focus on weapon smuggling, illegally moving thousands of guns from Florida into the Caribbean. Many networks prey on our citizens who are disadvantaged and disaffected. Many glamorize violence and use it as a tool to intimidate local populations and to inspire legions of pseudo-imitators. And from criminal gangs to extremist groups like ISIL or Daesh, many networks exploit social media and popular culture using slick, high-quality videos and music that promote killing, intimidation, and a code of silence. Many more have local franchisees that spread like viruses through our communities. These networks as a whole and in their parts are woven into the fabric of our environments. And wherever they exist, in whatever form they take, these networks pose a challenge to our collective security. So what does this mean for all of us? Well, for one thing, it means that we require a different way of thinking about these challenges and a different way of working together to combat them. If we want to defeat these network challenges, we have to out-adapt them. That means we require more effective partnerships and greater trust. We must see each other not just as friends, but as equal and trusted partners of choice. We must constantly challenge ourselves to share more, to do more, and to connect more with each other. We must find new ways to work together and share information. We must constantly ask ourselves, not what information do I need, but what information do I have that my neighbor needs? And together, we can create an alignment of strengths to make our individual vulnerabilities irrelevant. We must exploit new technologies and not be afraid to challenge old ways of doing business. We must seek out and leverage the expertise of civil society, academia, and the private sector, who can bring fresh perspectives, unique skill sets, and innovative solutions to bear on these complex challenges. And we must hone the skills and capabilities that our forces need to succeed in a transformed security environment. Certain fundamentals will not change. Enduring principles, like, found, like the respect for human rights and equal opportunity for our men and our women, these are and always will be the bedrock of our legitimacy with our civilian populations. But in this brave new world of networked threats, we also need to think about how we recruit, train, and cultivate the very best possible teams. Teams that understand how to work across services and agencies. Teams that thrive in multinational coalition settings. Teams comprised of solid professionals, including our non-commissioned officer corps, and diverse members with the right mix of skills and strengths to thrive and win in a 21st century security environment. And finally, we must seek out every opportunity to build, to earn, and to preserve trust. For me, trust is a guiding principle that will determine how well we work together in times of peace and in times of crisis. It is a guiding principle that determines whether we fail as many individuals or succeed as one united team. As all of us who have chosen to serve our countries know, true success is a collaborative effort. At the end of the day, 
When the mission is complete, what matters most is who stands next to you. So take a look at the person to your right, take a look at the person to your left, and take a good look around this entire room. This is our network. This is a network that stretches from Ottawa to Port of Spain, from Bridgetown to Paris. Let's use it well. So once again, thanks very much to all of you for being part of CANSEC 2016. Now, it's time to get to work. Thank you very much.